chapter of the book of the Acts of the Apostles. We're talking just last Sunday about why it's never good to, while you're turning to, to the, the eighth chapter of that book, why it's never good to really pick on somebody who has a problem pronouncing words, and I was trying to figure out which which words I have a problem pronouncing, and I think I talk relatively good from time to time, but A-C-T-S has always tripped me up. <coughs> so, the book of Acts. You know where it is. The fifth book of the New Testament. The Acts of the Apostles it just never quite sounds right when I say it. Mm. The Acts of the Apostles, the eighth chapter. And we're going to read a little bit more than what I had planned. We're going to read 26 through the end of the chapter, which would be 26 through 39. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. This man has gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home, he was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me? So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. The eunuch was reading this passage of scripture. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before his shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. Tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about? Himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture. You should know that that passage of scripture is Isaiah 53. Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. Go and make a difference. Go and make a difference. Every soul, sisters and brothers, every soul is worth saving. I have never seen anyone who devoted a life to saving, redeeming, teaching, guiding, lifting, or inspiring. 
I have never seen someone who devoted their life to somebody else. At the close of their life, I have never seen them say, heard them say, or heard anyone else say about them that that life was a wasted life. That life was an insignificant life. We must never take for granted the great responsibility or the great joy that comes in our lives when we take time out to simply help somebody. The leaders, I heard this this morning, I believe, in church school. The leaders that sacrifice long enough to help and save are worthy of a double portion of honor. See, a double portion, huh? Our names may never make the 6 o'clock news. We may never get a certificate to frame. There may never be a monument outside the church with our face on it. We may not be superstars as much as role players. <clears throat> and yes, we may not change the course of history, but what can we change? If we can't change the future, at least we can change our family. And if someone ever thinks about us, in years to come, someone who we have worked for and worked with and prayed for, in years to come, if they ever remember our name and then give God glory because we have passed their way, that is a life that living will have not been in vain. Philip was a leader that left a great revival just to make a difference. Philip was in Samaria, a town where the Jews, we saw this this morning in our gospel lesson, where the Jews did not trust the Samaritans, and the Samaritans did not trust the Jews, and the gospel had never been preached in Samaria before. There were no churches in Samaria, but Philip showed up and started preaching a revival. But because the gospel is so strong, even though they didn't trust Philip, they could not resist the living word of God. And Philip preached to packed houses every night. After he preached, he laid hands on folk, and the folks recovered. He spoke, and the folks responded. He invited them to come to Christ. And because of his preaching and his leadership, they, they came and joined and created and formed the church. But Philip, the Holy Spirit tells Philip, I know it looks like you're doing a great thing here. I need you to go somewhere and make a difference for somebody else. And we don't see anywhere that Philip argued, that Philip bargained, that Philip tried to stay where he was. But Philip goes from the great city of Samaria down a dusty road and he goes with nothing but the word of God in his pocket and the assurance of the Holy Ghost. Yeah. On his way, Philip meets a man that does.
comfort is confusing him. That Philip asked, do you understand what you're reading? Philip realized he had an opportunity to share the gospel with somebody who may be lost. And he says, I need to tell you that it's not talking about a sheep really going before the shearers. It's not talking about a reed really being bent and broken in a field. Since that piece of scripture is talking about Jesus. It's talking about the way that Jesus grew up. How Jesus was born in a rugged fashion. He lived the life of a rugged carpenter. Was baptized by rugged John the Baptist. Tempted in the rugged wilderness. When he got out of the wilderness, he found 12 rugged disciples and he got them together to turn a rugged world upside down. He worked among rugged people, had a rugged trial, was handed over to a rugged mob. And Philip explained at any time, Jesus could have called down angels to save him. But instead, that lamb before those shearers shows the die on a rugged cross, on a rugged hill, under a rugged sky, when the sun refused to shine, and he died between two rugged thieves among rugged soldiers who gambled for the only piece of property that he owned. Philip told him that a rugged crown was placed on his head. Rugged onlookers cursed him and mocked him and spat on him. And when it was over, they put a rugged spear in his side. And he went through all of that so that we, as rugged sinners, in the hands of a rugged Satan, under the sentence of a rugged death might somehow get it together and be saved, sanctified, Holy Ghost filled, and fire baptized. And he had to let them know that the cross of Jesus was more powerful than the ruggedness of that cross because Jesus took that old rugged cross and he took the sting out of the cross and that's the only way that 2011 years later they can be at the cross at the cross where we first see the light if Jesus had decided not to go through with it we would not be able to sing that the burdens of our heart are rolled away and it's that reason it was there by faith we received our sight. And even in the middle of a rugged world, we can sing that we're happy all the day. So Philip explains. He explains that the same choice that Jesus faced is the same choice we have to face. What's the choice for everyone to hear? Let me give it to you as easily as I can. The choice is ruggedness or righteousness. Yeah, yeah. When lies are floating around us and those lies have our name on it. Ruggedness or righteousness. When we have an opportunity to get our enemy on the job fired. Ruggedness, righteousness. When we look to the left, we look to the right, and we don't see nobody, and we just know we can get away with it. Ruggedness, righteousness. Do how do we 
can handle difficult people, difficult situations, difficult problems. Do we do it with ruggedness or righteousness? Yes. Even when Jesus' enemies came to arrest him, <coughs> Peter took off his sword and cut the man's ear off. Jesus said, those who live ruggedly will die ruggedly. God's leader told the man he could be saved from ruggedness to righteousness if he repented of his sin, believed in Jesus, and received the baptism of the Holy Ghost so he could move from ruggedness to righteousness. And so now, we see that the eunuch is informed about the difference between ruggedness and righteousness. Yeah. He knew and now we know that the world has enough people already who know how to fire back a cuss word when you give them one. Already the world has enough people who can exchange one frown for another. But what the world needs, what our households need, what our young people need, and what the church needs is just the four few more examples of righteousness. Yes. So they reached a piece of water. That's why I wanted to read on this morning. They got to a little piece of water. They didn't get to a baptism fountain. They didn't get to the healing springs. Well, they didn't get to a waterfall. They didn't get to a, a necessarily a fresh water body of water. They just got to a piece of water <laughs> off a dusty road. And he says, there's some water over there. Can I be baptized? Bible says, Philip baptized them. The eunuch went one way shouting. Philip went the other way preaching. The Bible says that Philip didn't see anybody else on that road. But God sent him out of his way to make a difference just for one. So finally, fair of you, if you make a difference just in one life, yeah. I declare you've done enough. Yeah. Just one is enough. Yeah. Jesus was going through Jericho, heard blind Bartimaeus crying for mercy, and he stopped his caravan to save one. Jesus looked up saw Zacchaeus in a tree and he stopped what he was doing just to save one. Jesus was in a crowd of folk and he felt a woman on the hem of his garment and he saved one. Don't worry about full pews. Don't worry about good attendance. Don't worry about getting a crowd to hear your message. One is worth saving. Yes. One yes. is worth it. Jesus said, you can even leave 99 sheep behind and go and get me that one. Yes. When Jesus was dying on the cross for the sins that you commit and the sins that I commit, he took time to look to his left at the other thief and say one. Even after he had gone back to glory, he had time to knock Saul just one off his high horse. Yeah. What's your point, Reverend? Mothers, keep on praying. Yeah. Fathers, keep on praying. Yeah. That child is worth saving.
saving. Teachers, keep on teaching. That student is worth saving. Christians, keep telling your story. Tell them the same story that you've been telling the past five, 10, 15 years. Sooner or later, they will decide whether they're going to be rugged or whether they're going to be righteous. But that person is worth saving. Keep praying your prayer. Keep singing your song. Your co-worker is on the way to picking up their own cross. Husbands, wives, keep on trying. Your companion, your marriage is worth saving. God still cares about little old you. He still cares about little old me. One is still important to God. It won't be easy, but it will be worth it. Keep in mind, I must save one. I must do good. I must do well. I must keep going strong. Put Lila's favorite song in your heart. If I can help somebody as I pass along, if I can cheer somebody with a smile or a song, if I can show somebody they've been traveling wrong, then my living shall not be in vain. Then I will be proud when I stand before the throne. Then I can expect God to welcome me home. Then I know that my God is opening up the doors for me. And he has two words on his lips. Well done. Well done. Well done. You went the extra mile. You did something for somebody else. You weren't selfish. You weren't greedy. It cost you something, but you did it anyhow. I got up here to preach this sermon. I wrote two words down. Many of you saw me because your eyes weren't clo closed while we were praying. <laughs> so you saw me. <laughs> and I wrote, a, I, wrote, I wrote to remind myself of a story that I heard when I was in elementary school. It said that a boy was walking along the beach early in the morning after the tide came in and there were starfish as far as the eye could see laid out there on the beach that the tide left there. The little boy knew that those starfish needed to be in the water. He knew that if the sun came up and those starfish were still out on the beach the sun was going to burn them up and they were going to die. So on this long, mile-long beach, the boy started reaching down, picking up a starfish, throwing it back in the ocean. Reaching down, picking up a starfish, throwing it back in the ocean. So there's an uh, older man uh, not too far away, and he said, he watched him for a little while. He said, now, young man, I don't mean to discourage you, but do you see how many, how long that row of starfish is? I admire what you're trying to do, but you will never make a difference with all of these starfish here on this beach. I thank God for the courage of this young boy. The story, the way I read it, the boy reached down again, picked up a starfish, and he reached down again and picked up a starfish, and he reached down and picked another, and then he finally addressed the young man. No, I will not be able to reach all of those starfish, but I just made a difference to this starfish. And so, sisters and brothers, they reminded me yesterday, the old good WMS sisters reminded me you can't always go to Charleston to preach. Sometimes you got to preach the best way you know how in Anderson. Somehow I got to make the difference where I am, right where God sent me. And no, I may not be able to throw starfish.
from Anderson to Charleston, but I can make a difference to the ones I touch. Yes, yes. yes. Word going forward today, you will not be able to make a difference to everybody. But if you are able to bend down and pick them up and touch that life and throw them back to water where they would have died of thirst and heat, then doggone it, you make that difference. But if I fail, the old head of the church says, but if you try, fail in your trying, and your hands are scarred and sore from the work you've begun, the hymn writer says, take up your cross and run quickly to meet him. God will understand that you are trying to make a difference, and he'll say, well done. Great God, I'll follow.